Hello, and welcome to the Sector 2021 Secure and Scalable Development with Microsoft 365 and Azure AD. My name is Peter Carson. I'm going to be your presenter. Um, I'm the president of Envision IT and Extranet User Manager, uh, two companies located in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, also an 11 time Office Apps and Services Microsoft MEP. All my contact details are here, so feel free to reach out. And the, uh, obviously it is a recorded session, but the recording will be available after the fact as well. And we'll be posting slide decks up onto our Extranet User Manager site as well. Also president of the local Toronto SharePoint Users Group. So quick agenda, what we want to cover off. Um, we've done the introduction, so I'm going to start with a, a quick session overview and goals, take us through a number of different application scenarios, talk about scalability, and lastly, talk about managing multiple environments. So going a little deeper into the session overview and goals, first and foremost is just I'm going to be very open and transparent. Uh, we're actually going to use open source and commercial software that we develop at Envision IT and, and really get under the, the hood, have a look at how it's built and, and understand how we build our modern cloud-based apps. So it's not a product pitch. Uh, feel free to call me out in the, the Q&A during the session if you feel that it is. Uh, I'll never not do that. And under the hood, you know, the, the focus really is Azure Active Directory. That's the security infrastructure that we're going to be focusing on here today. And it's how do we build secure and scalable Microsoft 365 applications. So that's the goal of, of what we're looking to achieve. And, and how do we do that uh, across multiple different non-production environments as well? How do we support dev, test, um, as well as production in a Microsoft 365 Azure AD type of scenario? So let me start with a, a little background. Uh, Logan's my, my sales manager. I think he wants to make a drinking game out of the, the number of times I say security through obscurity is not security, but it's so true. And unfortunately, it's something that we see a lot, particularly in Microsoft 365 and SharePoint Online even today, where, where people may feel, you know what, if I hide this, then it's secure. People, people don't see it. It's, it's a hidden list. There's hidden columns in there. Maybe I've hidden SharePoint as a whole. Uh, but really, you know, I think I'm probably preaching to the, the Choir here, um, people should understand that hiding is not securing and obscurity is not a way to deal with it. And, and there's some other things that we've seen in, in the SharePoint Online world, you know, using workflows to, to try and deal with security, using um, specific permissions in SharePoint Online that allow you only to see your items. You know, that can get a little tricky from a security point of view as well. So really what I want to focus on today is, is how do we do this right? And, and how has Microsoft really raised the bar more recently in terms of providing the underlying infrastructure to do that? So as I mentioned, I'm going to use two different application scenarios to kind of guide us through uh, what this looks like. So the first is an open source solution that we've been publishing for a number of years now. It started out as a SharePoint site request feature and it's turned into a whole Teams provisioning solution um, and, and all the sources available. So you'll be able to grab bits from that based on what I'm showing here today. And the other is our Extranet User Manager suite itself, uh, commercial products. So I'm going to get under the hood a bit in terms of how we've architected that and how we're leveraging Azure AD to provide security in that context couple of links to, to refer to. So if you want to get more detail on the Teams for revisioning, GitHub uh, repo links to, to get the actual source code, go to our envisionit.com site slash product slash Teams for revisioning. Um, obviously, there's the product site for External User Manager. And in that site is, is the event page for this event itself. Any additional links, since I am pre-recording this in advance of the, the actual session, um, I'll put up on that event page there. So you may find some additional links in there come live time. So let's start with the Teams provisioning open source solution. So, so really this is about Teams governance, you know, making it easier for people to, to do self-service requests for new Teams, for providing structure and governance and templates around that. There can be approvals, there's standardization around templates and such. I won't get too much into the details of it. I want to focus more on how it's built under the hood. Um, so it's a combination of a number of it different technologies. The actual request form on the left here is built as a SharePoint framework web part. So you deploy that into your SharePoint tenant and then you can drop it on the sites from there. It submits to an Azure Logic app that uses PowerShell running in, in Azure Automation and some Azure Key Vault to do the actual provisioning. 
So let's talk a little bit about the underlying security design. So starting with uh, a zero trust security design concept, you know, the, the idea that you never trust, you always verify. And that applies at each level through what I was just showing there. So things like the client side apps, which that SharePoint framework web part falls into that bucket, they're inherently untrusted. They're running in uh, the end user's browser on their local machine. You know, a savvy user can jump into developer toolbar, start manipulating things and, and mess with your code quite easily from that. And things like uh, shared access signatures that we'll see in a minute in logic apps, um, you know, those are not secrets. You can see them under the hood. You can watch the network tab and, and see what's going back and forth from that point of view. You can bypass business rules. So at the end of the day, the, the trusted code that you need to run from a security point of view really shouldn't be running in the browser. It's got to be running in a backend API. And those APIs shouldn't trust their callers. Um, you know, they, they need to understand who's calling them and, and not from a parameter point of view, but from a verifiable uh, process. And, and access tokens and OAuth, OpenID Connect are great ways to, to do that. You know, so just to kind of reiterate, browsers are an untrusted environment, so don't depend on it to run your secure code. Now, it doesn't mean you need to stand up servers. You know, we're going to use a lot of different serverless uh, scenarios like Azure Automation, Logic Apps, and App Services that are all platform as a service from Microsoft. So let's actually start with the first one, which is Logic Apps. Um, Power Automate is, is the close cousin to, to Logic Apps. Both can be set up as a secure API. I prefer Logic Apps are a little more enterprise scale um, and, and provide a little more control on some of the things we want to do here. But basically, you can trigger a, a Logic App workflow through an HTTP POST uh, REST method. Could be a GET or PUSH, PATCH, DELETE. You can define what those are. POST is the most common. We're posting from our form into that effectively backend API. Um, so when you save that logic app, it generates a URL and it includes a shared access signature secret that you're supposed to keep private that sort of secures your logic app. But kind of going back to my original, you know, security through obscurity concept, that shared access signature, if it's exposed up into your front end uh, JavaScript code, it's it's not secure. It's, it's very much available for anybody to see. So what we want to do is actually configure Azure AD authentication. So we're going to register our SharePoint Framework web part as an app in Azure AD. Um, we'll have the client ID in there, and we're going to record it in the Logic App authorization to, to connect those two together. And the nice thing is SharePoint Framework has the plumbing to support this. So let's look at the, the overall solution architecture that we're talking about here. So we've got our SharePoint framework web part here on the left, um, and it's going to post what's been entered into the form into this Logic App workflow. It's using an underlying SharePoint list to, to store requests and track processes through. Um, and it's also got this validate bearer token Logic App that we'll go into in a minute to have a look at the security side of things there. And then ultimately, when it's ready to go, you know, maybe there's an approval step that's happened. It's going to call it to Azure Automation and, and run some PowerShell to actually provision things over here. So let's flip in a quick demo and, and take you through what that looks like. So let me start with uh, what we call the landing site. This is just a, a SharePoint site collection that we've deployed the SharePoint framework web parts into. And it's this one on the right here, which is the request web part. Um, actually, let me refresh my browser screen. I had this open from before. And, and we'll start at the beginning. So you know I can pick what division I want my request to go into, what type of team I want to create, maybe it's for our clients, and, and a number of parameters here. Now we've kept it very open. We, we collect a lot of things here. Typically you would um, lock down defaults and hide a lot of these choices for your users. But regardless, we've got a, a, a web part or form here, and we want to submit this into a backend logic app. So let's go have a look at that side of things. So if I come over to my resource group th for the solution, uh, let me just sort it by the type of apps that we've got here. We've got connections to the various different services. We've got our automation that we're going to come to a second. And then we see a series of logic apps through here. It's actually the submit form that I want to go into. This is what gets posted to by that SharePoint framework web part. So if we edit this uh, first off, we can see that it's triggered off an HTTP request. It, it is a post request. And here's the post URL for that. So if I look at the end of this, uh, this part here, the signature equals, uh, this signature is generated uniquely for each instance of this um, 
logic apps. If you deploy it to multiple environments or different resource groups, you'll get a different signature for each of those. And that's intended to be one level of security. If you can keep that URL private and, and make sure that it's not exposed out in the browsers and such, that's reasonable from a security point of view. So if you've got another API calling this, that's fine to use that signature from that perspective. But in this case here, uh, we don't actually want to use that. We want to use Azure AD as that. So let's actually come back to the authorization on the Logic App. And you can see that we've set up the, uh, the client ID for the SharePoint Framework web part app as an audience for this Logic App. And what that means is there's going to be an OAuth authentication that happens between the, the web part and the Logic App. So let's just have a look. Actually, before we do that, let's come back to, sorry, into the edit mode on that again and just have a look a little further down. So we've got this call out to a, a secondary logic app. So you can chain logic apps and build sort of a, a hierarchy of them to keep them organized. And this one is validating the bearer token that comes in. So it basically gets past the, the header that came into the original logic app and it's going to do some verification of that. So if we have a look at that logic app, see what it's doing. Um, probably a better name in hindsight, rather than calling validate bearer token, is really parse bearer token, because I'll show you in a minute, uh, this is not actually doing validation of it. It's really just parsing out the data um, and based on the, you know, the padding and, and structure of that base 64, uh, token string that came across, it's going to pass back various different elements from that. So we can see the response object coming back with that decoded user string and a status code of 200 saying, yep, we're good to go from that point of view. So what's actually happening under the hood, if we look at that OAuth conversation that's going on, when, when somebody hits submit on that web part, and we know that we're going to call the logic app, uh, what SharePoint Framework is doing first is saying, hey, go talk to Azure AD, figure out who's signed in, who's hitting this web part right now, embed that in the token, bring that token back here and pass it across to the logic app. So this is coming as the header of the post to the logic app. Now, the nice thing is that we don't have to worry about the actual validation. The middleware in logic apps, Microsoft takes care of that. So it'll pass the token back to Azure AD and, and verify to say, yes, is this a properly signed token that came from Azure AD and it hasn't been intercepted and meddled with in between? Nope, everything's good from that middleware token verification point of view. It comes back to the, the logic app. And this is where we call out to our validate token, which really should be a parse token that's pulling that user information out of that and returning ultimately the response from the whole workflow transaction back to the web part. So if I look back, actually, let's flip back into our main submit form here. If I come back into the edit on that. So when it calls the validate bearer token, it gets a response from that and it's able to parse that. We can actually see all the data that's coming back in that token. So we can see things like given name and, and such through there. The, the important one that we want to get is actually the user principal name or the UPN. So this is the unique identifier that says, who's calling me? Who was the person that was signed into SharePoint Online and, and clicking that submit button that caused the post into this logic app? And we can trust this because it was verified by Microsoft as part of that OAuth flow through here. So that makes that much more secure from that perspective. Now, if we come down the queue, so once the logic app has done what it needs to do, maybe it has some approval steps in there, um, and ultimately it says, hey, I'm ready to go create the team and all the, uh, the related pieces that go along as part of that, all that heavy lifting actually happens in PowerShell. Now, what we do is, is we actually run the PowerShell in Azure Automation, which is a great way to, to run it serverless. You don't need a virtual machine. It's all platform as a service, um, and it's very cheap. I mean, you actually get 500 minutes of free runtime with your subscription, and it's two tenths of a, a cent per minute after that. So, I mean, a typical run of the scripts for for doing what we're doing here is, you know, anywhere from less than a minute from a simple communication site might run up to 10 or 15 minutes for a full team site and Microsoft team. But still, you know, we're talking very minimal dollars as, as part of that. In fact, it's actually pennies. Um, so how do we build that piece of it? You know, how do we do that 
Daemon um, talking to SharePoint teams and other things from there. Well, uh, not proud of this, but unfortunately, the, the way we had to do this in the past because we didn't have the support from Microsoft was to use a user credential, have a username and password. Um, now, there is a credentials store in Azure automation accounts, and, and under the hood, there's a private key vault that secures that. So that's all good from that point of view. The problem, though, is that if you're using an interactive username and password in a non-interactive backend process like this, you can't turn MFA on multi-factor authentication on that account. And that's a big no-no these days. You don't want any exceptions on your user accounts. Uh, so early in the year, back, uh, I think it was February of, of 2021, Microsoft completely revamped their, their patterns and practices open source um, platform that we use to, to build our solution. And, and they refactored it into, into modern.net core five, made it multi-platform and, and also strongly embraced service principles and certificate-based authentication, which got us away from these challenges here. So, you know, that was a big security goal there. What you wanna make sure is you're using a service principle. So if you're not familiar with uh, the difference between user objects, application objects, and service principles, let me take a minute just to, to go through there. So in the past, you know, it was pretty common practice to, to store user credentials and use them in integration scenarios. And that's a big no-no. You know, yeah, you can put them in Key Vault, but you get into the MFA issue around that and you don't want to disable, disable MFA even on you know, what you consider to be a service account, which is actually still a user account. Service principles are very different. They're actually intended for these backend style daemon processes or API to API, you know, server to server type of integration scenarios. And, and typically the authentication is done uh, through a secret or a certificate with a client ID. And, and we prefer certificates um, as opposed to a secret. So they're kind of the preferred approach. And when we're talking about uh, things like Azure Automation, it actually has support out of the box for what's called a run as account, which is a service principle. And Microsoft actually manages the certificates for you. And, and in any case, there's a private Azure Key Vault under the hood. Um, Azure App Services can do this as well. And I'll talk about that in our, our last scenario that we go through. So just to kind of reiterate the application objects and service principles idea, when you register an Azure AD application, that is an application object. When you give that application rights to do something against a resource, like, hey, I need to be able to create Microsoft Teams and SharePoint team sites and things like that, um, that's creating a service principle. And, and that could be cross-tenant as well. You can say, hey, I've got this application in this tenant here, and I'm gonna give it rights in this resource over in this other subscription over here. So we're gonna have a different service principle uh, for here for the same application. Uh, the scenarios that we're talking about today are all within one tenant. So the service principle and the Azure AD, AD application and the resources are all within one tenant from that perspective. So if we look at that um, same style of OAuth authentication that we had before, but in this case, instead of an interactive web part that has a user associated with it, it's a backend process. It got triggered by the Logic App um, to run that PowerShell. So what needs to happen is we use that service principle that's created as part of Azure Automation, and it's got its certificate stored in the private key vault here for us. We don't need to take care of that. That's all managed for us. And so when PowerShell runs and it's calling out to the PNP, um, we're passing the client ID and the certificate to the, the PNP modules. And just like before, that can go up to Azure AD, get the client ID and the certificate, can call with a token. Actually, I missed a couple arrows here. It should be pointing back up to Azure AD to do the verification there, um, and then ultimately return the response back from there. So what does this look like under the hood in Azure Automation? Uh, basically, when you create an Azure Automation account, by default, uh, there's an option to create a run as account. So you want to leave that turned on. And, and what that does is it actually registers an application in Azure AD. So you'd actually go in and see that account. You can get its display name. You can look at the, the app registrations in Azure AD and search for it and actually assign it permissions. And then when you're creating your run books, you use that service principle, that client ID and, and thumbprint for the certificate to authenticate to the applications. So again, let's go under the hood a bit here, uh, show you what that actually looks like. 
So let me come back to my, um, sorry, Azure portal. I'll come back to my resource group. If we go up, here we have our automation account. Uh, so I can scroll way down on the, the left here. They buried a fair bit down here. Oh, I went too far. There we go, is my run as accounts. You can have multiple run as accounts in here. I've left it just with the, the default run as that was created as part of the Azure automation. So if I click into that, I see all the details. Here's my display name, other certificate and thumbprint that are gonna be used, um, and all the connection details, the application IDs, actually the client ID in Azure AD. So let me come up here, just copy that display name, and I'll go into Azure Active Directory and into my app registrations. You may not see it under your own if, if it was set up by somebody else. I always go to the all applications. I can paste that in there. And there's my app registration for that client ID that we're seeing over there as well. So I click into that. Um, if I look at my certificates and secrets, uh, this is the, the, the one half of the certificate. The other half is in the, the private key vault underneath the run as account. What I want to do though here is have a look at the API permissions. What does this app get to do? And, and it's pretty broad. Uh, these are all application permissions. I'll talk in a minute about delegate versus application. And because this is creating teams across the whole tenant, creating SharePoint sites and OneNotes and, and such through there, it needs quite broad access. It needs to create groups. It needs to read and write groups, and it needs to manage the members of the groups. Uh, we've got some OneNote integrations as part of our solution, so it needs that. Um, needs to, to read all the user's details, and it needs to come into SharePoint and, and has full control across all the site collections so it can configure the sites that get created through this process. And all these require um, admin consent. So when you're deploying the application, there's some steps you have to go through to, to grant that admin consent and set everything up from that point of view. Um, so you can see it's fairly fairly high level of security that it has, fairly high level of, of access. So you need to be careful. I mean, least privilege still makes sense, but unfortunately in this case here, due to the nature of what we're doing, we do need pretty broad access into that. And if we look back in our PowerShell that ultimately we're gonna be running in there, um, so there's a couple of simple uh, commandlets. Basically there's this get automation connection where I give it the connection name of that run as account and it gives me the, the service principal information back from that. So from this, I can then get the application ID and the certificate thumbprint, and I can use that to pass across to the, the Microsoft PNP, and it will then use what the permissions are applied to that um, client ID and, and allow my code to run from there. Now, one of the challenges we have though is, is when you're building your scripts, running them up in the cloud is difficult. You know, you can't actually step through the code from there. So how do you test this authentication style locally? Now, well, you still go through that registration process. You need to create a, an app in your Azure AD, give it all those same permissions through there, um, and, and basically get a certificate, or typically what we do is create a self-signed certificate. We have a little bit of PowerShell that lets you create that self-signed cert um, and upload that up into the Azure AD app registration. And then what you do is you take the PFX private key certificate and, and basically load it up into your local um, MMC, so your local certificate store on your local machine. And, and we actually have all these steps documented in the, uh, the Teams provisioning white paper that goes with the, the source code that's open source through there. So if you want to get more detail into this, uh, go to that link on the Envision IT site from there. And, and basically then you use the client ID and the thumbprint from that cert to authenticate from there and you can run all the same code. And we've basically set up our open source code so you can run the same code base locally as you can up in the cloud. So it makes it really handy. I can set breakpoints, walk through the code, you know, debug it. It's just a much easier way to develop from there. Then you can take that same code, upload it into a runbook in an automation account and go from there. So um, I'm sure everybody's aware of the, the details behind the SolarWinds hack. I guess it was about a year and a half ago now. Um, you know, I mean, it started with fairly rudimentary password spray attack to, to get into the systems, but they got a little more sophisticated from there. Once they were on the inside, they were actually able to, to compromise the privacy key certificate that was used for SAML signing uh, for, for 
uh, SAML authentication. Once they were able to do that, uh, they were able to validate to other single sign-on systems and, and impersonate and get around MFA and password change and, and such because you weren't actually going through the authentication. You were, you were basically providing forged tokens from there. And SAML is very similar to, to OAuth that I was just describing, so the same approach could be used here. So it is really important you know, that you, you do proper controls around those private key certificates. So some of the things to think about, you know, obviously keep them in Key Vault or somewhere secure from that point of view. Consider things like premium hardware security modules if you want to go further from that perspective, rotate them regularly. But really the most important one is, you know, if you are doing local testing like I was talking about, do that against the development environment. Don't, don't do it against your production environment. Don't have a local certificate on your local machine that gives, you know, full rights to, to your entire production tenant. That's a really dangerous place to be. Um, so, you know, as much as possible, let Azure manage those certificates. So things like the app service, private key vault, the, the run as accounts are great ways to, to manage that. So uh, switching gears, I'm, I'm going to come over our, onto our commercial products. So this is our Extranet user manager suite. Uh, it's all about building a, an external digital community. Uh, really what I want to focus on is how it's built. So we've got a, an Angular front-end UI, uh, .NET Core 5 middleware. We host all of the, the various different elements in Azure App Services. And, and really, it's, it's built on top of Azure Active Directory B2B and SharePoint Online. So a quick solution architecture diagram. We've got a number of different app services that are running for the end user portal, for the admin Angular application, for the, the API that's talking to Azure Active Directory and SharePoint. We've got lots of different logic apps that are doing different things in there. So let's start with a, a real quick demo. Again, it's not going to be a product pitch, but I just want to give you a little bit of context. So if I come into our, our uh, admin. So this is our Angular application talking to a backend .NET Core API. So I can do things like say, hey, you know, I want to add a new group in here. And, and maybe I don't have rights to, to add groups. But let's go ahead and put in a sector demo group here. We'll talk a minute about delegated versus app permissions and how you can elevate people's permissions as part of that through there. I can go ahead and save that. It's talking to our API, which is then talking to Azure Active Directory, uh, doing things in there, loading up the group for me. And, and I can come into the group and say, hey, you know, who are the members? Who are the owners? And yes, I can do all of this through the, uh, the Azure portal. The idea is that, that we empower business users, delegate it down to users that are never going to want to do things in the Azure portal, make it easy to do them in here, have you know, invitations, approval workflows, all those sorts of paths through from that perspective. Whoops. Let me just add those members to the group. And, and I can actually open that, this up in Azure. So let me go over into the Azure portal just to show you what it's doing under the hood. I can see that security group that was created through the app there because it's live talking through the graph in. And if I look at the group memberships, oh, sorry, no, the members. There's our uh, two members that we added in through the interface. So, you know, if I come back to the solution architecture on this and dive in a little deeper, so we were just in this client side app, that Angular app that's talking to a, an Azure App Service API. And, and much of the same things that we were looking at previously with the, uh, the Teams provisioning web part, you know, we're doing the same sort of OAuth um, authentication through here. And, and we're using the, the service principle for the app to talk down to SharePoint. We're actually talking in a couple different ways. We've got uh, delegated and application type of permissions. So delegated basically uses the user context and, and you know the user has to have the permissions to do the things you're asking and doing, whereas the application can have its own permissions independent of, of who the user is behind that. So let's have a look at those API permissions. So if I come back over here, let's go to my app services. Where did we go here? Got a lot of app services. I want my sector one. There's my demo sector. Oh, actually, what I want to do is, is come into my app registrations again. So back in the Active Directory. <clears throat> 
Go to App Registrations. And there's my um, front end Angular app and my API. I want to go into the API itself. So if we come down into API permissions here, it means you've got a, a big mix of delegated and application permissions. So the idea is that where, where possible, we use delegated permissions where the user has permissions to do that, and those actions are done by them. Uh, but where things like maybe creating a group, if we've got an approval process around there and we don't want to give users direct rights in Azure AD to do that, we can come in through an application permission to do that. So we can kind of mix and match um, through there. So there's some real advantages to that in the sense that you, you can basically build your own security model above and beyond what Microsoft provides. Um, just be aware of things like auditing, you know, that happens in the context of the app and those permissions tend to be very broad. So you got to be careful as you're going through there. So we're going to switch gears here a bit and, uh, and focus more on the scalability side of things. And, and it's actually closely related to um, what we've just been talking about in terms of how we authenticate our apps. So something to be aware of in Microsoft 365 is the concept of throttling. And, and this is used by Microsoft uh, basically because it's a multi-tenant system. They don't want one client hammering it to the extent that it, uh, it negatively impacts the other clients they have in that same farm or in that same uh, part of the, the, the world. So what they'll do is they'll pass a, uh, a fail with 429 saying, there's, hey, you're making too many requests or a, a 503 server busy back for you. And, and the 429 actually gives a recommended wait before retry. And, and what you should do is, is actually recognize that. It says, hey, you need to wait 60 seconds before you try again, and you ignore that, you could end up ultimately in a situation where your tenant as a whole is completely blocked. And, and the other thing is Microsoft doesn't really provide a lot of details or metrics around this. So it's hard to predict exactly when this situation is going to arise. In fact, you're you're not technically supposed to load test against Microsoft 365, so it's tough to to do any sort of experimentation on that. So what are the recommendations? Um, you do need to decorate your traffic. There's some guides in the link there that that tell you how to decorate your traffic to say, hey, I'm I'm respectful. I'm going to obey the retry recommendations that come back through here. Now, in throttling, though, there's two different types of throttling. There's user and app throttling. And it really comes back to um, how you are authenticating. So if you're coming in as a regular user, that's user throttling. If you're doing the delegated um, app requests that we were just talking about, those are treated like user requests as well. So if you've got 300 people hitting your SharePoint through your delegated app, it looks like 300 users using it. And it actually scales well from that point of view. You're likely not going to get into a, a throttling scenario unless your your delegated app for each user is, is hammering the heck out of um, SharePoint Online, in which case you may get locked down from there. The difference is when you use application permissions, they're treated like one app. So it's kind of like one user coming through. So if you've got those 300 users, as far as SharePoint's concerned, or, or Microsoft 365, it looks like a single user. Now there's a higher threshold given to an app according to Microsoft, but again, they're, they're very vague on any sort of details of, of how the throttling actually triggers, probably because it's, it's very dependent on what else is happening in the environment at that moment in time. Um, so what we've done in, in one of our client scenarios where, where we did have a large number of users and they were coming through app only, um, we actually used the auto scale features of, of app services to scale not just for CPU, but also for app registrations. So it's probably easier to show you with a picture. But basically what we've got is, is our main um, app that's going through and doing the, the app only permissions to, in this case, SharePoint Online as that service auto scales out. So that's triggered off of load. So number of users, uh, CPU load, et cetera, it adds additional loads or additional servers automatically to that. What those nodes do is they go back into a, a SQL table that we've built and, and grab another client ID and actually come in as another app registration through here. So if you think about those 300 users coming through as one, you know, but it's scaled out to five nodes in there, it's actually five applications from SharePoint's point of view, and it scales nicely. We probably shouldn't have, but we did do some testing. We used uh, 
uh, some performance load testing to scale up into thousands of users. And we saw the auto scale doing what it was supposed to be doing, where it was adding nodes out from there. And, and where we saw throttling on, on a single app call previously under those sorts of loads, uh, because it was being balanced across multiple apps, it did scale out nicely from that perspective. So it worked quite well. Uh, so just something to think about from that perspective. I'd like to get a white paper together on this. Uh, probably won't get it together before the uh, the conference airs this, but you know, have a look at my blog and, and see if I got something posted up from that point of view. Uh, the other piece is just managing multiple environments. You know, how do you leverage Azure Active Directory to support development, QA, production, tenants? And, and one of the things we strongly encourage our clients is to actually set up separate tenants for their dev QA and production. Don't just parcel out a piece of your, your Azure AD and your, your Microsoft 365 and say, that's my dev or that's my QA environments, build up an entirely new tenant. And you can get developer subscriptions for free from Microsoft. Uh, just be aware they do expire if, if you leave them unused for uh, 90 days or longer. Uh, we generally recommend, you know what, just pay for a tenant. Get one or two users, cost you 10 bucks a month. You don't have to worry about it expiring and your, your dev environment is there and available or your QA environment is available. But how do you manage access into all these different environments? It can get pretty complex from that point of view. So we've actually built some, some PowerShell scripts. I'm gonna post a link up onto the event page around this. Um, and, and basically it synchronizes groups and users from your production Azure AD into your non-production. So you can define uh, development groups, test groups and such in your, your, your production Azure AD, put pr regular production accounts into those. And then the script will say, hey, replicate those groups. In the <coughs> Excuse me, sorry and those guests as um, users in those non-prod Azure AD and sync them across. And what that means is when, when one of these production users wants to access that development environment, they do with the broad credentials. And if they already have broad browser open in, in production, they can just jump right over into dev or into test. They don't need other credentials through there. So it's much simpler from that perspective. So it's basically a number of SharePoint lists that tracks the, the Azure AD tenants, the, the Azure subscriptions, and we actually use it to, to manage things like contributor access into the Azure subscriptions or global admin access into the Azure AD in those non-prod environments. Uh, so it's pretty flexible from that point of view. And, and the plan is to, to open source out those scripts as well. Um, so have a look up onto the event page to, to have a look for that. So last piece, um, just you know, talking about how we use this in our environment. So our external user manager website itself is a, an Azure app service. We have a, a CMS version of that that's a separate app service and some uh, some backend integrations from that. So you know, we've got this environment that we want to replicate to, to have a non-production version of that as well as our production. We also leverage a feature uh, from Microsoft App Services called deployment slots, where you can have multiple slots within one environment. So we actually have a staging slot and our live slot for our website. So we use Azure DevOps and, and build pipelines. So our build pipeline deploys out to our non-production Azure App Services. That's our dev integration. We can do our testing there. Uh, we can deploy that to a QA environment. We don't actually have a separate QA. We're not a big organization. But then our build pipeline can deploy a release version of that into a staging slot. We can actually do further testing there to say, hey, is that all ready to go? And when we're happy with it, we just hit the swap slot and that live becomes the production environment. The production environment becomes the staging slot um, and away we go and we're live from there. If something goes horribly wrong with that, we can actually swap it back and, and roll it back to the previous version that was in the staging slot there. So I think my time's just about up here. Uh, so as I mentioned before, have a look at the, the links here. Um, I will put additional links up onto the event page as well. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody for, uh, for joining in for the session. Have a great rest of your sector.